Let's start off with the basics. I'm sorry, first of all, for not being able to do Periscope last week. I was really all set to go on Thursday, and the platform crashed right as I was about to log in. Not my fault. Um, it was a uh, actually a toss issue. It obviously was resolved quickly, but not quickly enough to do a broadcast. So, unfortunately, the last few weeks for me have been... Um, have been really busy, so I haven't had time to do the weekend. I'm um, sorry, the periscopes as I normally would do in, tr in the middle of the week. I usually like to do them Wednesday, um, usually Thursday at the latest. Unfortunately, they've been happening on Fridays, but I'm going to try my best to get that back to Wednesdays. Uh, the goal is really to have the weekend review on Sunday and then to have something as a supplemental during the week to make up sort of for the lag if things happen early on in the week. If you ever miss one of these broadcasts, or you come in in between, or you're new, the place to find them, like if you want to catch up and see it from the beginning, or see previous ones, or the weekend review video, is my YouTube channel, which is Justin Pulitzer Trades. There's a link to that in my, in my Twitter account, which is at Justin Pulitzer. You should be following me there, and also subscribe to my YouTube channel. When you're subscribed to the YouTube channel, you get notifications when new videos are posted for the weekend review, for the Periscope, and then also special edition videos when they come. I have a few of those that I've been teasing that I'm working on. Uh, they are going to be, they're going to be pretty good. The next one we had uh, we had done a uh, had done a survey on Twitter. The it, the topic is going to be short selling and. It was either that or the risk management um, 2.0. Um, that will also is also going to be in the works. It's not an either or, but the first one will be one on short selling. That should be out in a couple of weeks. I think it'll be very very useful to many of you. So let's jump right into what happened today in the market and what's been happening for the last um, few days. So. As we all know, today today was a down day, and frankly, I was surprised that um, it. Well, I mean, it wasn't god awful. I mean, we were down about ten bucks in the ES, and we closed actually um, about almost eleven dollars underneath the VWAP. So it was a pretty sort of in the hole close. I think it was a lot of um, a lot of day time frame people who were playing. I guess they had kind of tried playing some longs. And they got stopped out. I mean, I'm actually very surprised the last couple of days that the um, market has held up so well. We've had some very high-profile earnings blow-ups. Uh, IBM yesterday, today, and then before the open today, Chipotle. Um, I wouldn't say that was as big of a debacle and blow-up, but it, it was down. It was down pretty solidly. And... Then today, I mean, we've been up. I mean, we've been up multiple days in a row. We basically were coming into some resistance. I'm going to flip back to uh, SPY. I was just talking about um, the ES. I mean, they're basically synonymous, but a lot of people I, I, I know um, trade in SPY. It's, it's very popular in, in IRAs or in accounts for proxies. A lot of people don't have futures accounts, so I like to kind of just talk about the re... I'm a retail trader. Most of you who are watching this are retail traders, at least the ones who will admit they're watching. I know that there are some larger people who watch this and they don't necessarily always fess up to it, although I do see those levels on TV once in a while, I do notice. Anyhow, that's neither here nor there. Um, so we were up multiple days. I had said the la that before the, um, the pullback, we had ha the market has really been doing kind of everything correctly. Um, it, it, it had the double bottom in the 87s. Like I had said, we never retested the 82s. It rallied up. It had the gap from 195. It was a gap right into secondary trend resistance. The next day was a doji, which I thought was bullish. And then we took off after that. We started to get into some of the resistances up at 201.90. We backed off. I had said that those two days, I said this in the weekend review, that those two days were back offs with positive breath. And it felt forced. It just felt like people were trying to be cute. We rallied further, and today we kind of, and, and yesterday we were sort of getting close to that 204.12 to 205.38 area I've been talking about in videos, and then of course the um, the down the the big primary downtrend line is up in the 205s. That is actually possible still, believe it or not, to go there. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, today's price action though didn't surprise me either. 
Uh, we, like I said, we've been up really a lot of days. This was sort of the breakout, right, where we closed around. Uh, the close today was, it was just below, a 201.85, really 201.90 is the range, but it's sort of kind of close enough for government work at this point here. We'll have to see how that, how, how that plays out the next day or two, considering, like I said, we had a bit of a underwater close, although I wouldn't say it was underwater enough that we couldn't still be down further. Um, so that's really been the, been the case. We, I, we all know we had the, the big pullback, the correction, and then I think that the high profile earnings blow ups were really what are kind of capping this from getting to the primary downtrend line. So today we had some, some issues. The VIX, which I had discussed in, in my video, got to the mid 14s to low 15s, which I said I thought for this go around was going to be range low. I didn't think we were going to traverse fully down to the 12s like we have in the past, and that turned out to be correct. Um, I will say this though, for much of the day, up until the very end, the VIX was actually flat to down. Um, it was down off, it was up off of the lows of the day, but it wasn't really up. And today we still closed below 17, so it's sort of still below any panic levels. Um, now that we did bottom where I thought we did in the cycle, it's going to really be up to the uh, to the VIX. The it should resist somewhere between 1757 and 1785. Those are some proprietary levels on the VIX that I use. You probably won't be able to spot them so easily in the chart um, unless you have kind of like my um, my hawk eye. But I, those were tops in some previous um, areas. That's really sort of like where the VIX has traded most of its time below, at, with, with the exception of spikes higher. So the VIX had been down multiple days. We got into where we needed to be, and today we had a reversal. It stalled on the 200, so we'll have to see if that does stall it or if we do get the move into the 17s. Either way, it's sort of okay still. So that was, that was one thing that was going against us today. The next thing was a tug of war. First of all, oil had, re had reports. They, uh, they, they, the inventories weren't that good, and oil was under has been under pressure the last couple of days. And we all know the oil stocks have run tremendously. They have been pulling back a little bit here. So that has been putting pressure also. The other issue here... And one that I can't stress to you enough, it's really become a really important issue in the market, is the biotechs, the IBB in particular. So today was a tug of war. It started out okay because Biogen, which really got this started with their blow off top, um, turned. They had a good earnings, they were up. But intraday today, um, and, and this is not new, you've had Valiant coming down for multiple days, but today was really something else. They, um, they had Citron basically say that, who's a, a famous short, they're like a Muddy Waters, and if you don't know both of them, they're basically just short selling firms. And the algos pick this up, and of course, you know, we all know what happens. So this was, I mean, a major debacle. I'll just tell you, I can't, I'm going to explain why this was, why a stock probably most of you haven't heard of was so important today. So this stock peaked at $263 and today reached an intraday low of $88.50. It didn't all, it didn't traverse that whole obviously range today, but uh, the close yesterday, at, at, which was a hideous day also, was 146 and the stock was trading 88 today. I had posted in a chart today that I thought one, between 106 and then, of course, down here in the 88s, 89s was going to be key levels and potentially a low. And it did. It wound up being the low on the, um, on the downtrend. The, the Ackman came out. Yeah, many of you don't know Bill Ackman. He's a, a big hedge fund uh, manager, and he's long this stock. I think intraday he was down something like a billion dollars on this position. I mean, if I'm down like... If I'm down anything, I get crazy. I, I mean, if I was down a billion bucks, I don't even know. I mean, that would be um, that'd be something. Although I guess it's a high quality problem. If you have a billion that you're down, you probably have many billion. So um, I don't think you know his uh, his ski chalets or his yachts or whatever he has is are really um, in danger of being in in the repo just yet. But um, a lot of hedge funds are parked in that stock along with him. And I think what you saw today, the, the momentum stocks had been running. They had been chased a lot the last few days. They were coming off. 
you had a, just a, ser a combination of things that lined up today that caused this sort of weaker day. And, and believe it or not, today really wasn't even that bad. It, may have, it, it felt pretty bad, but it wasn't as bad as you might think, unless, of course, you were in these stocks. So I think that that was a forced liquidation, margin calls. Um, Sun Edison was down too. That's another one of these hedge fund stocks that have kind of blown up. And I think a lot of these funds were sort of liquidating because they have, you know, there's risk management rules and there's two sets. There's ones that are sort of on individual positions. And this is something that I preach a lot too. I haven't lately, but there's individual stock rules and then there's the keep the lights on rules which means that you, if you lose a certain amount overall, it like sort of trips, it's sort of a tripwire, a fail safe, the dead man switch maybe on the subways, remember the old days in Pelham 123, the original one, you had to have the dead man switch, anyway. So that was what I think happened and you saw like a wholesale liquidation of stocks and of course that hit the, you know, the Amazons, the Googles, Tesla blew up yesterday, um, I'm going to talk about that here briefly for a second. I've been warning, and I did it in real time. I said that I thought that Tesla was going to come under pressure because of the Ferrari IPO race. And it, boy, did it. It got jammed down yesterday pretty, pretty good. Um, they gave it the business. And today, race came public, and you know, a lot of people who are cutie pies on the stream, and maybe they'll be right for a few days or a couple of weeks, were saying, were saying that, you know, that it was the race top, the Ferrari top. And I think that's really because of um, Facebook when that came public, that was an IPO that didn't do well initially, although that has been, since the dead lows, really my favorite stock. Not to, you know, not to really pat myself, on, break my arm patting myself on the back too much, but I hated that IPO at 38. This is all documented in real time on Twitter. If you wanna go back and look at these tweets, this isn't revisionist history. I hated that stock all the way from 38 down to about 20 bucks. And I turned to 20. It got to 19 and then never looked back and the stock is almost at 100, which has been my prediction for a long time. When even when people hated this stock, I was saying that I thought it would eventually be 100 bucks. We're getting really close. We've been in the 99s. I think there's just some people who are kind of selling ahead, you know, because they want to get their get fills. And the stock has honestly felt a little bit uh, a little bit heavy the last couple of days. I think people are kind of waiting to see the quarter. We all know that Facebook has struggled with Wow, I jumped into Facebook. I really wanted to finish up Tesla. So I'm going to finish up Facebook and then circle back to Tesla quickly. So Facebook, we all know that they've been struggling from from currency, currency issues and that has been the big problem with 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 their or previous earnings reports and the price the stock's price reaction afterward, as well as what we've been seeing when companies have been missing, they've been going down huge because they haven't been doing well with their foreign currency hedges or what have you. So I think that's my biggest concern. If Facebook keeps up and rallies strong into their print, it may, believe it or not, be you know kind of too late. It has held up really well. The stock was doing very, has been doing exceptionally well with a handful of other stocks, and um, it does. I do believe at some point it will be trading well north of 100. But let's uh, let's cover that bridge when we get to it. Let's circle back to Tesla quickly. Anyhow, a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, they wanted to fight me on the stream about this. Why would why would people sell Tesla to buy race one sexy car for an even sexier car? Teslas are nice, but they're not Ferraris. Guys on Wall Street are all testosterone junkies. Who doesn't want a Ferrari? That's sort of it, you know? I mean, tons of bragging rights, saying you own you know, a piece of the company. You know, if you go out to meet a girl at a bar, it's probably pretty sexy to say, hey, you know, I own some shares of Ferrari. <laughs> anyway, whatever, that, that, um, that's what happened. And then the, um, they had a Consumer Reports um, note come out that w was not good that you know they had had the uh, they had, had had the highest rating last year i think they broke the uh, test machine and that uh, you know that that did really well and then of course the um the the news wasn't good and i think that just accelerated the the decline i will i can't stress to you guys enough this and this this principle if you could really get this down it will save you so much pain at the very least and maybe even make you a lot of money. 
So let's go through it. The trend is your friend, and the news always falls along the line of least resistance. So if a stock is in an uptrend and the news comes out, it's probably going to be bullish and it's going to push the stock up. If a stock is coming down already, the news is probably going to be bad and it's going to sell off more on that news. The opposite is, is if a stock has been down or has been up huge already and a stock gets bad news on the lows and doesn't go down on the bad news, that is probably the bottom and it rallies. If a stock is up you know, near highs and it gets really great news and it can't rally still further, that's probably the top. Always remember that. The, the news always falls along the line of least resistance. And just, just be prepared that that's going to happen. And that's really what happened. Believe it or not, as crazy as it sounds, that's really what happened in Valiant today also. If that stock was true, truly bullish, no report could have taken it down that much. It means that the holders were weak. It means that they're probably, I don't, I don't know if it's a fraud. Everyone jumps to fraud all the time. I think that's sort of like the staple. The algos pick up on that and they like that. It's sort of like throwing chum to sharks, right? They like hearing that word. But um, that or rate hikes, that's, that, that, those are the, the, the real, the, the ter get the terminators going. Anyhow, the point being is that if a, a stock is truly bullish, the news can't take it down if it's bad. And if a stock is truly bearish, good news can't take it up. That's just sort of something to know. And I find a lot of the times people are often using their, they, they don't have their position based on their bias, but their position, their bias is based on their position. So let me explain that to you. Let's just use Tesla since we're on Tesla. You're bullish on Tesla because you own it or you own Tesla because you're bullish on it. If your answer wasn't the latter there, you are going to get yourself creamed, particularly with a stock like Tesla. Anyhow, I, I detailed that quite a bit in my weekend review video. I don't want to um, belabor that, but let's, let's go through that. Anyhow, the point really was is when you have these big, these big stocks liquidating, a lot of people are like, oh, my big, what does that have to do with my big stock? The truth is, is that a lot of the momentum stocks have correlation. And if someone sees Netflix blow up or something else is down 100 points, Valiant, they start thinking, hey, maybe that could happen to my stock too. And they just get out. They don't ask questions. They kind of ask the questions later. That's sort of still how it is. Anyhow, that's, uh, that's the story with Race and Tesla. Um, also was weighing on the biotics today probably was that um, Vice President Biden decided not to run for office. And we all know that Hillary Clinton is out there kind of pounding her chest about reigning in biotech um, earnings. And also today, I think, launched an attack on the healthcare stock. So she's on the rampage there. Um, I don't want to get too much into the politics of that here, but we all know that any regulation that comes into an industry devastates it. Look what happened with financial regulations. Everyone keeps talking about these financials, that they're going to rally, someday they're going to be great. The answer is, is they're never going to be great again until the, the, until the regulations are removed. People don't understand that their earnings profiles aren't what they used to be. They have been neutered in terms of uh, regulation, in terms of how they can make money. They're basically, a lot of them are just savings and loan institutions at this point. They're not the, the profit centers that they used to be. I don't want to, again, I don't want to get into the politics of that. I, I'm more of a, um, I, I'm, I'm just commenting here on, on what is happening, not whether that's good or not. I personally am, am, am not a huge fan of tons and tons of regulation. I'm more of a free market guy. But in, in some instances, there, there is some regulation that's important. Oddly, all of the financial regulation that was done wouldn't have addressed the financial crisis of 2008 and 9 at all. It, was all. it wasn't all hedge funds gambling that was the problem. It was all basically um, crappy loaning, l lending standards, the ninja loans that fueled the housing boom. Anyhow, that's, that's that story with that. One piece of good news that did come out today, it did close slightly red, and I had discussed uh, at the time with, with Apple, was, uh, was Carl Icahn. He has formed a super PAC, and he is looking to, he's basically looking to try and make it so companies can bring money back from overseas. I wonder why he's doing this. Um, 
maybe because he has a large position in Apple and they have like more cash overseas than I think our treasury has, period. Um, yeah, that would be a, a major bonanza, the no-brainer, uh, as he calls it, for Apple. If that cash could come back here, they could b fuel amazing amounts of buybacks, dividends, um, maybe business investment lines. I will tell you this. Um, I don't want it, you know, not to be too political here, but I do believe that it would be very good for companies, particularly U.S. companies. This, by the way, will put pressure on the dollar to the upside, which could be a hidden story about why the dollar has been strong. If companies are buying um, dollars with foreign foreign currencies, that could artificially boost the dollar up. That could oddly be good for companies and then also bad at the same time, as crazy as that sounds. Anyhow, um, I do believe that it would be very good for companies to be able to bring back that money. This is I'm editorializing here a little bit. This isn't. This is my opinion here. This isn't fact. I will tell you what I think the fact is and what will what I think should be done and what I think will be done. So let's go through that. What I think should be done is that they should allow the companies to bring them back with some stipulations. I'm not really so concerned about the amount that they kind of take the pound of flesh, although we know there's going to be a tax. I think that they should make it so that that money is earmarked toward business investment, um, like hiring plants and property plants and equipments, large ticket items. What will happen, of course, is it will come back and it will be thrown into dividends and buybacks. And it will be, it'll be like sort of a supplemental QE. So maybe it saves the Fed and the Treasury another round of QE. So that is probably what will be the case. Eventually, I don't know that it's going to happen under President Obama, but maybe with a President Trump or what have you, that could be, um, I don't know, maybe Hillary, if, they, if Apple donates to the Clinton Global Foundation, the initiative, maybe then she'll be uh, you know, in favor of it. So that, that's really what I think will happen. Eventually, that is going to probably, will probably happen when, I don't know. Anyhow, that's, that's the story with Apple. So that covers my, uh, my spiel with what I had initially wanted to talk about. And let's get into some of the questions that um, you guys had. Um, that's what I think was important. I always have to get in what I think was important. In the end, you know, this is my, my periscope. I, I have to, there is some sometimes things that you guys might not realize are important, but they really are actually. So let's get into some of this stuff. So Twitter, we opened up Morgan Stanley, uh, downgraded Twitter today. Um, we all know that Twitter has been under a lot of pressure. They've had some leadership issues. They are doing rounds of firing. I don't uh, usually tech companies like you know a lot of the problems with Facebook in the past. Excuse me, has been investors worried that they're spending too much money, that they're you know hiring recklessly. This was a problem with Google, and now it's a problem. Um, but these are growth companies. Twitter has a growth multiple. This is a very big problem for Twitter because they aren't really growing their, their users. Their earnings on the last quarter were fine. That wasn't the problem. The problem was that they had no user growth. And I don't, we know Prince Alwaleed bought more shares. Steve Ballmer bought in, although he might be the kiss of death. Um, but we, we know that they, they have a, still have a growth multiple. There are a lot of people who are still piled into this stock. And actually, the downgrade and the move down today, if you're really truly a Twitter bull for the long term, was good because you shook out a lot of the weak, um, weak hands today who have been chasing the stock. And I've been saying that the more the stock rallies into the quarter, the bigger the risk comes of having the thing get smashed again. So if it's already down and it's smashed a lot before, what, will it get smashed again? I mean, maybe. It's still really expensive. Believe it or not, the stock could be cut in half again and still be expensive. As crazy as that might sound to people, it is possible. Um, I'm not really willing to make a call on, on Twitter earnings yet. I really want to see how it trades right before then. It's sort of the whites of the eyes type of a, a situation. I also want to see how the pessimism is on the stream, if everyone's really still rah-rah bullish or if they're bearish. Same thing, it's sort, sort of, um, I, I, oh, so there was a question I had posed this morning. I don't want to mention the gentleman's name. I, don't, he didn't, I didn't ask permission for it, but I'm just going to tell you. He asked me today, was the Twitter downgrade the same as what I thought happened with GoPro the other day? 
The answer was no, it was because Twitter has already rallied a lot off the bottom, and GoPro was at the dead lows when they downgraded that thing. I mean, you downgrade, where were these downgrades? I call them, um, I, I, I borrowed this from that guy, Josh Brown, who's on, on, on Fast Money, he's, he's witty. Uh, clown grades. The, a clown grade is when you're downgrading something, like let's say a stock went to 100 to 20, now you're downgrading it all the way. Where weren't you downgrading it up all the way up at the highs? So now they're first downgrading the thing at the dead lows. So the low for GoPro, believe it or not, might even be in. Eventually, I think that stock is going to single digits. I think it's a flip camera times two, uh, 2.0. But, you know, if you're, you get a ton of downgrades at the dead lows, it could be a temporary bottom for a while. The stock could rally potentially into their numbers. I don't know if I'm going to... I did nibble a little. It was down today, which I wasn't so thrilled about. But... Um, I have some puts that are expi short puts that are expiring this 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 week, so that I don't know if I'm going to re-up them or not. So they they they're they're doing well. I mean they're doing pretty well, but we'll see if that gets into any trouble. Um, so we'll deal. I'll deal with that on the stream if it happens. Uh, so that's Twitter. Uh, gold. I honestly I haven't been looking at that chart as much lately. Um, it ran into some resistance here. I can see up at the 200 MA. It looks like it's just pulling back a bit, but what I do like about the pattern here for the first time in a long time is it's made higher highs and off of higher lows. That's very good. So if you want to play, you know, maybe, um, maybe wait for it a little bit, maybe it pulls back to like the 50. There looks like a confluence of moving averages. The 50 is, looks like it's going to try and come up through the, through the, through the 100. So I like that confluence. That's down like in the 108s, 109s if you want to try it down there. Does that, that also coincides with some other lows, believe it or not. I like that before the extreme breakdown. So, yeah, the 109s, I think, would be a good area if you want to try right or right out for, um, for a play. Um, so that's gold. Silver also, I've actually um, been slowly building a position at 14 and below. I haven't talked about that a lot, a little bit, a little bit a few weeks ago, but not so much lately. Um, yeah, sure, silver could be cut in half to seven. That's the major big technical support. I don't know that that's going to happen. I've just, like I said, I've been slowly building a bit of a position in, in, the, in silver via SLV. I've been selling puts, actually. Um, the IV is uh, contracted a lot, so, um, you know, maybe wait for that to get jacked a little bit on a pull. But you don't want to... The, the truth is, is you want to sell puts on declines, not into rallies. Um, or you want to do put ratios into declines, not into rallies, because you get the bigger spread, but you want the IV to be jacked. And when the IV contracts a little, you don't really want to do it. It's um, When you have low IV, like you do actually in Facebook, um, I believe the price per IV percentile is low. That would be um, the time to, uh, the kind to do it. Uh, someone just asked about FXI. That was something I didn't get to cover. I, I have six market keys, by the way which are the VIX, the UUP, which is the dollar, the TLT, which is the bonds, which were up today, which is good. Um, TV reporters who've never touched money um, other than to pay a uh, check at a restaurant probably um, don't understand the inverse relationship between price and uh, bonds. Yields, low yields, and stock prices, a lower yield is good for PE multiples. A higher yield is not so good for PE multiples. If you remember that, you'll do well. Um, so that's, that's, that's that. Um, FXI was, has been rallying a little. I had mentioned in my weekend review, I had been bullish before. I was a little cautious because it was sort of at the channel top. Also, Baba was coming into some channel, uh, some trend resistance. I thought there might be a little bit more upside, but it was looking like it could be a pullback. That's all happened. That's what's going on in China. I don't know that we're in puke mode again, but I don't know that we're going to be in rally mode at least for a little bit. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, Gilead, I, I, all right, so here's the deal with Gilead. Um, they've blown out their earnings the last two quarters. They were fantastic. Um, I, I like this. I've been, I've played the stock bearish and bullish over the past year, and I've had pretty good success, actually, in both directions. So I think I have a little bit of cred on, on Gilead. But I think that the, um, the earnings for Gilead will probably be good. They're, um, they're, they're doing really well with, with their drugs. The fear, of course, has been, you know, the regulation. Um, also, I believe it's sort of um, the tail wagging the dog a little bit. So many people play the biotechs through the IBB, and these have big weightings. And I think when they sell the IBB, it takes down the stocks that are in them. It's sort of not life imitating, I mean, um, art imitating life, but life imitating art. It's sort of... Um, 
<laughs> it just it's just it, this is the equivalent of um I, let's not get it. Let's not. I don't want to get distracted. Anyway, the, it's Gilead going down. The, the 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 big bear case scenario for me would be, and this is one you probably won't hear. Everyone talks about, oh, they have such low PE multiples. The stocks are cheap. That is true unless if you're at peak earnings. When a cycle ends, stocks always look the cheapest. Um, oddly, in commodity stocks, when they're the most expensive, you know, there is usually when they're down the most because their earnings have collapsed. So, if the biotechs do get a lot of regulations or something, you know, whatever happens to lower their margins, they could be at peak earnings, and what looked cheap at five or six or ten times earnings could be 15, 20, 25, 30 times earnings under a you know a major regulatory scenario. So you have to be a little bit cautious. I do believe that, I mean, the absolute tail end risk, I think, is about 65. That would be an, a ginormous drop. I don't know that we're going to get there. I think if you want to play this selling puts that are 85 strike ish, near dated, not very long dated, but near dated on declines, probably will work. So that's the Gilead. Uh, the Google, the, right? It's kind of cool to say the before things these days, right? So Google basically ran hard. It it just looks to me like it exhausted. I'm just looking at this chart again. It, it just, I mean, the stock was up into some resistance. It didn't get to the very top. I've seen this chased. I don't want to mention any names. I'm sure you know who the, these types are, the ones who post Pictures of P and Ls that may or may not exist. Um, I was a little dubious in some of those in Priceline the other day because of having tra traded Priceline in the past. Those bid ask spreads aren't as narrow as you think, and to get fills on lots of them are a little dubious. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, anyway, the Go Google just ran up. I think it's pulling back. I think if you want to play this, let me just do the fib on it quick. I, my guess is it's the 50 MA, but let's let's just take from the flash crash low to the top. Uh, 6.34 would be the 61.8. Let's take from the pullback low to the top. Yeah, that's a little. That's probably going to be, I think, a little bit more relevant for this cycle. So the 50% there comes in roughly around 6.57. The 50 MA is just above there in 661, so probably around there you'll see some kind of a bounce. I would, it, the earnings are coming up with this. I, 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 the, if, you, if you're bullish, you want to see it continue down uh, into the earnings. Um, they report on 1022, so that's, that's, wow, tomorrow. All right, so let's see how that trades tomorrow. If the stock is up a little bit, I'll be a little bit more cautious. If it's down again, that would be, um, you know, a few, I think enough down that maybe it could be a, um, it could be a bit of a longer play. I've been sort of cautious with this. I've been really waiting for a primary trend touch, to be frank, which is down at a larger 61.8, which none of you who are long are going to want to even hear me talk about. But that's down in the 575s, and the breakout was 583. Google never really fully got back there. The flash crash kind of got it close. It um, filled the gap and it got down to the 593. So I would be into into doing that. no. That doesn't mean that somebody knows something necessarily. Um, someone just asked on the stream if the stock is down. Does that mean somebody knows something? No, it doesn't necessarily. It just means that people could be taking profits ahead of time. If somebody does know something and they get caught, guess where they go? They go to jail. Um, not to say that that kind of stuff doesn't go on. I know it does. I'm not naive to the fact, but I don't know that the stock pulling back ahead of the earnings means that it's it, somebody knows something. It could just mean that um, you know it's a shake and bake, which is one of my favorite setups. Get out some of the weak late sellers. There have been tons of people chasing this, these, this, and the Amazons with long calls, weekly calls. If you see a ton of people long these things, the the, the maximum pain, sort of what the market is designed to do, is to create the mo maximum amount of pain to the most people as often as possible. Um, that's what my buddy Brad always says, and I believe that to be the case. So I think that um, a move down probably would shake out a lot of the people who have been chasing it. 
The pattern looks kind of all right. The only issue I have with it is that it, it, it kind of looks like a rising wedge and we're, we got to the, a little bit above it. I would think that the better play, if you're going to play this, is probably to sell like some far out of the money puts or put spreads if you have a big account, if, if you have a smaller account. I believe they have the minis in Google still, I'm not sure, so that could be a little bit safer. Uh, you know, I'm always worried about people blowing themselves up, so that's sort of the, um, the, the story. Anyhow, um, that's the, the deal with that. I want to see, like I said, again, how that trades tomorrow. If it's up big, then I'm going to be a little bit cautious. I, I think Google probably does want to go higher, but I, wouldn't, I don't know that it doesn't want to go lower first. So let's just see how that trades tomorrow. I'll make some comments on that on the stream. Um, Amazon, kind of the same story. I don't want to belabor a dead horse. This thing just, you know, you have really great trade location if you're buying this thing in the 570s and the thing then goes, um, you know, and you're looking for 580. That is my, that is my big concern with, um, with, with, the, with these stocks. They've run a lot. They're already back up close to their highs. And sure, they, they can go higher, but after, you know, let's say this is one... Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ele day eleven of a rally, or are, are you the smart money in in there? I I do think longer term Amazon wants to go higher, but again, this is again the same problem I'm having with Google at this point, is that it's run a lot already, and you know, if something has run up already into the earnings, the kind of the move might have already happened. Um, you know, Often you'll see stocks like Netflix has been one that has defied the odds for a long time. These stocks have, um, Netflix ran and then ran again and then ran again. That is more the exception than the norm. The norm sort of is that you'll run and then it'll sell off or it'll sell off and then it'll run. So I would be really cautious if these stocks are just kind of hanging out here. I'd like to see declines before their, you know, their prints if you're playing it long. Um, I do think put ratios are always good options with these, but you want to be very careful with earnings. Um, you know, when stocks have run a lot, they're sort of, it's sort of the coyote over the, uh, the cliff, and they can, there's a long way to fall. So I always, if I'm selling puts or if I'm selling calls, you usually want to do two to two and a half standard deviations out. So let's, let's, do, let's do an exercise live in Amazon with what that means because I don't want people to come away with not understanding what that means. So the expected move in Amazon this week is $49 plus or minus um, in the next two days. So if you want to play this, you would be looking to sell minimum of um, 100 dollars or plus out of the money to be two standard deviations out. That's it. Um, so could Amazon have a hundred dollar move? Why not? Um, I, I don't see why it couldn't. I mean, stocks like Priceline do that all the time. Speaking of Priceline, um, when are they going to split that damn stock already? I mean, you know, I had had a uh, bet with my friend, um, I don't know, many of you probably used to follow her, um, uh, Montana, my friend, my friend Tracy. And she and I used to always argue which, um, which, one, of the, um, which one of these stocks were going to be the first to 1,000. And her bet was Google, and my bet was Priceline. And I explained it as that the stock was Ill illiquid enough that the stock could probably get there fast. And I actually wound up being right on that. It was one of, the, one of my greatest calls. Actually, I had gotten really bullish on that stock when it pulled back down to the 555. I don't remember if anyone remembers that. It was like a $100 down move or something, but it was really just to retest the neckline, the breakout. And I think a lot of people didn't realize that, and that was the dead low in the stock, and it really wound up being one of, the, uh, one of my great calls, of really, of all time. Um, lucky, skill, whatever, it, it worked. But um, that was my call that Amazon, I mean that, um, sorry, the price line would be the first to 1,000, and, and it did. It wound up being it. So now the stock is um, 1,300 and change. I mean, that's, that's a lot. I never really think that this should be a stock that retail traders should be trading in um, because it's so big, and I think a lot of people could, don't understand the kind of risk that they can have in this type of a stock. It's run a lot. It got back up to the 1395. I did say, if you didn't see my weekend review, check it out. Um, I'll post a link to it in the description of the rebroadcast on YouTube. 
But the top of the channel up here is like 1441-ish, 1440-ish. Um, so yeah, there there is some room to go higher. I, I, I had posed that I thought that the stock was just in a big channel. The, um, the fact that it's run up into some resistance already after multiple days, you know, this is getting a little iffy again. You know, could it gap and go? I mean, or gap and kind of gap and crap like the last time. Take a look at what it did the last time. It had like a $100 move on earnings into the top of the channel, oddly. And then it just fell apart because it had already run multiple days. So that might be the option. The, I like to do, I like to be the proponent of not playing these on the print, but playing them afterwards, sort of being the second mouse to get the, gets the cheese. The first one gets its neck snapped, and then the, um, excuse me, then the second mouse gets to, you know, gets the cheese, gets to, to, to be the winner. So I usually like to play these for continuation or for some type of a fade trade afterward. Um, it just takes out that gap risk, um, unless it's really obvious, you know, like if you've had Apple down like, you know, five days or seven days in a row before earnings, you know, it's probably going to be a gap up. It's, same thing with these, you know, you've had, I mean, Priceline rallied one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, like 13 or 14 days. I mean, this is like two weeks of rally right into the resistance and they have earnings coming up. So the best thing I think this stock could do, honestly, is just go sideways for a few days and consolidate this. I would love if it just kept on running straight into the print and set up for an amazing, you know, probably $100 short. Um, but we'll see. Um, anyhow, uh, Bob I covered, Tesla I covered, Facebook I covered. So I think we're pretty covered here. Is there anything else that I missed that anyone really wants to, um, to talk about here? Um, just type it out if you want. Also, I just want to give a caution to some people. There are a lot of guys on here who are very opportunistic, and I think that they sell a lot of a lot of. Um, I think that they just make things out to seem a little bit different than they really are in reality, and I think that uh, everyone wants to say that they, you know, they caught a lot of the big moves, and they want to be involved in every single move in every single stock. That isn't really possible, um, to be honest. I mean, to ca nobody. It would be. Go I always give the, um, the 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 old saying that um, no, I don't want to. I don't want to call anyone particular out. There there were a bunch. I'm, I mean, I'm not talking about just one here. Just so you know, I'm talking about mo a lot of people on here, and they sell. You know, they they kind of build themselves as people who are always right. Um, you know, they, they post a lot about, about their, their right plays. I don't see very much about their wrong ones. And the truth is, is, uh, is you know, I, I always talk about right or right out. I get stopped out a lot on plays, um, but I always define my risk. And the losses usually aren't that ginormous, the, and I usually try to let the gains run. And I talk about those. I always give those levels, and I'll talk about often talk about if I'm wrong on, on positions. It, it doesn't happen at all that often, but it, I mean it happens. I don't see these people talk about that, and that really disturbs me. And it, I'm also dubious when someone thinks they're going to catch every single move in every single stock, long and short. That's really not the case, and, it, and I, 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 I have a lot of people I talk to on email or, di or direct messages, and this is sort of, I've noticed a trend in this, and that's, why I, that's really why I want to bring this up. Um, I, a lot of, this is not an easy market right now, just so you know. This isn't the 2013 forgiving market where the market is you know, trending straight up. It's really been sideways for most of the year. I haven't been that bullish the entire year on, on the stock. I haven't been as bearish. Maybe, I don't think people really realize just how bearish I was. Um, I, I was trying to give that, this was really before the big drop um, when we were in the consolidation. I'm going in the way back a little bit. And I had, um, I had been warning and warning and it happened. You know, we got the really big drop, and then I had said that I thought that there would be some type of a rally back up into this resistance, and we're really getting there now, so just be a little bit careful. You know, it is possible that there is another leg down. It's also really possible that we have a, another, you know, th that we're, we haven't seen the low, that, I, mean, I mean the high, that there is some type of a blow-off move into the, you know, always try to keep your mind open. I always, I'm never so dead set in my ways whether, you know, that I ignore price action or that I think I can catch every single move every single time. Honestly, I've been saying a couple of things here. 
trade in smaller size with a smaller time frame looking for a smaller swing. That has really been what's worked this year um, consistently, at least for me it has. Um, I find that um, I'm the most comfortable trading in, on trending, in trending markets and trending stocks. That's usually when I want to play in larger size. You know, the, um, when, when, when the market, when all things are not sort of hitting on all, firing on all cylinders, I'm a little bit more cautious and I don't sort of have like all my ducks in a row, so to speak. Like if, if for example, I'm bullish on a stock, but the market isn't doing well, Instead of buying, you know, X amount of shares, I'll buy half of X amount of shares or a quarter of amount of, of, of those shares. That's sort of how you avoid blowing up, and that's really the most important thing. Um, I've been trading for a long time. I think a lot of you guys know that. I think uh, I've been trading since I was a teenager. I'm sort of like almost like a Livermore in that respect, that I was... Um, I used to go into class in the, in the 1999, 1998 times, and I'd buy like, you know... At the time, maybe it was like 25 or 50 shares of Amazon, uh, whatever you know I could afford at the time. And I'd go in and I'd come out of my class for like a bathroom break, and the stock was up 15 points, and I and I'd be out of it. You know, I'd be out of it quick, or you know the reverse with the short or whatever. But um, you know the market isn't really like that as much these days. It's um, it's sort of it's it's sort of a little bit different. So my my advice is just sort of. Don't just don't blow up your accounts. You know, don't trade in size that you're not. You know, don't really guess. My guess. My, a lot of people I get questions about with stocks. They're kind of get, really guessing. They're, it's like a gambling type of mentality. And true professionals, and I mean the ones that take money out of Wall Street, not the ones who are you know you know playing the long shot at the track or trying to pick the long shot for the Super Bowl or 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 tons of you know people like this. They always are looking for the big killing, the big score. And the truth is, is that to get that big killing and the big score, you have to take on enormous amounts of risk. I remember I was in class, and I'm sorry if I'm going over. I really, I really, I think this is really important. Believe it or not, this is probably the most important part of this broadcast. Um, because this is really gets into my head of how I think and how I think that, um, how I really would like you guys to be thinking, to be honest. Um, taking the big shot, you know, trying to swing for the fences Yes, you'll hit it out once in a while, but the truth is, is you'll probably have a huge strikeout record. The truth is, believe it or not, the guys who hit the most home runs have the biggest strikeout. <laughs> Some of them have the biggest strikeout records, but it's hard to. I mean, but they can. They're getting paid millions of dollars to do it. You know, when you're playing with your account and you're taking tons and tons of you know big big swings, you're going to have a lot of misses, and the misses might be really b bigger, believe it or not, than the gains. So I, I, I find, that at least for myself and for the guys who I notice who consistently make money on, on, in the market, are the guys who play for the sure money, so to speak. Yes, there's no such thing as 100% probability on anything, but there are trades that you know are probably going to be more likely to be winners than others, but yeah, you might not make as much money on them. But at least they'll be consistent winners. You know, if you have to p use your trading, I, I do this full time, so I have to pay my garage, I have to pay for my, my apartment, I have to pay my own health insurance, I have to pay for food if I take, you know, if I take a girl out, if I take, um, if whatever I do, I have, to, I have to pay for that. So the goal is to know that I have consistent money all the time, and I think that's really what most of you are trying to do also, consistently take money out of the market. And that's when you change your mindset from the mindset of an amateur to the mindset of a professional. And that's really what my goal is to sort of do. And it, it sort of disturbs me a lot that a lot of the questions I get, and I, don't, I understand if you're, if you're in a position you want to know what my opinion is of it, but what I really think is the, is the goal and what I try to seek, at least with Periscope, is to teach people sort of how to fish rather than give them the fish. Although uh, you see some of the questions I get, you, people not only want, want me to give them the fish, they want me to fillet it. They want, you know, gut it, fillet it, cook it for them, give them a little bit of melted butter with it. I mean, it's, some of these questions are really kind of, uh, I mean, a little silly sometimes. But... Um, you know, for the most part, I think that there are, are, are a lot of, you know, good people on here that are just trying to really to make it. And I'll, I'll tell you, like I said, um, contrary to a lot of the posts you'll see from people, this has been a harder market for most people. Um, you're not always going to have, you know, a, a huge percentage batting rate. But the truth is, is you really just want to keep those losses small and let the winners gain, run. 
But in this tape, like I said, I, I can't keep saying this enough. Smaller size, smaller time frame, and look for a smaller swing, meaning you know, if you're looking for a stock to go up, you know, 10 points in three weeks, maybe take three points in four days or whatever, you know, you, you, can, you can get. That is, um, that is my advice. And take, take profits along the way and don't play the hope game. You know, if you're down in a position, one of the things that disturbs me the most from a lot of, I don't want to mention, any, again, any names in particular, but these are the sort of the same people that are always averaging down in positions. If a stock, like, let's say you were averaging down in Valiant, for example, um, VRX. You think that did you well today? I mean, honestly, I mean, if you bought this thing all the way down, you know, from 263 down to 80-something bucks today, I mean, you're just compounding the mistake. Here's the, here's the truth of the market. You can either start in a position correct, correctly and right, meaning, like, let's say, I'm going to just use long, for example, um, or I, we could do, this is, could be either way, long or short. I mean, I, I, I don't want to show that I have any bias in terms of how this, it works both ways. So let's say you buy Apple, for example. I'm just going to use that because it's a big common stock that a lot of people own. And you buy it at, let's say, you bought it at 109. That was a key support level that I mentioned. If the stock went to 107, a lot of people will say, oh, buy more. If it goes to 103, buy more. Why? You're already wrong. You're losing money in the position. Would you, inv would you, it's, have you ever heard the expression good money after bad? That's the same thing in the stock market. I used once in a, I think it was in my risk management um, video, like if you're stocking inventory in a store, like let's say you have two shirts. One of them is selling out really well and you have to keep reordering those and you have to put that into, um, you know, they're flying off the shelves. Would you buy more of the other one that's just sitting on the shelf that nobody wants that you're probably going to have to blow out at a discount? Think about that word there, discount. When a stock goes down, it's selling at a discount from where you bought it. If you buy inventory that isn't selling, you have to sell it at a discount that you, exactly, sunk in costs. Don't buy the ones that are doing badly. Do more of what's working. If you're long you know, a stock and it's going up and it's going up, your next buy, and I know this is controversial and this flies in the face of Warren Buffett and all these, these guys have billions of dollars. They can do this. They can afford it. And they eventually could influence the stock enough that it could get their money back. But like, look, look at Warren Buffett, for example. I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to criticize the guy. He's a legend. I, you know, I'm not trying to say that I'm on the, you know, the level of Warren Buffett. Believe me, I'm not. I'm not a billionaire. Um, I don't have the track record Warren Buffett has, you know. But he's been buying IBM on the way down for a lot already. I mean, it could be even be 100 points. I couldn't afford that. I don't know if you could. The truth is, is you want to buy stocks when they're rising. Your next buy should always be greater than the, ne the one you paid, you know, you already bought, uh, bought at. Your next buy should be more expensive. So that's, that's the point. Um, if a stock is going down, you're already starting wrong. It's like sort of like building on a weak foundation. Like would you build a building on it? I'm just trying to give as many analogies as I can to kind of beat this, into, beat this point home. Um, that you don't want to start off weak. You want to start off from a position of strength, not from a position of weakness. And if a stock is already against you, psychologically, that can cause a lot of damage. Someone asked me on this stream the other day, do I, have I ever bought a stock after my initial buy was incorrect? It was, was, was not, I wouldn't say incorrect, but yeah, I guess it's incorrect, lower. Um, so it's incorrect. There's no justifying it. If you buy something and it goes lower, you're incorrect. Um, the answer is yes, but here is the caveat, and this is a huge, huge caveat. It's if I've been feeling for the bottom. Like if a stock is close to a 61.8 FIB, and it's also close to a trend line, and they're within a couple of points, I'll often start off nibbling into that position. Or if something is at a reference level, or between reference levels that are within like 5 or $10, and the stock is $300, for example, that is not really wrong. It's sort of like within a point. So I'll sometimes do that. Like if it's within 10 points is a lot, you know, I mean, if on, you know, a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand or whatever, how many shares, that could add up to a lot of money. So I will often 
buy start smaller like I'll buy you know 200 here or 200 here or what you know whatever to get into to get into the position so or if I'm selling puts you know I'll start off with a few here and then kind of layer into it but I always have a number in mind that if it passes that point you know I'm out of the whole position so that is um, that is sort of how it happened I actually did a management a minute a real-time management on Twitter once um, of Facebook when a position went against me. I had been short puts and I had rolled them down and I increased size. Why did I do that? Because I knew that after multiple days down the probability of a bounce was higher. It was into some support levels. But I wouldn't say that that was bad practice adding to a loser. It was good risk ma mo money management and risk management, believe it or not. Sometimes the better risk management is in that instance. I'm going to go over some more example of these, I think, going forward, particularly if they happen in real time. I think that that's always the most useful. But um, the answer is yes, but with, with that caveat that it's sort of like feeling for the bottom or if, it's a or if I'm managing a position. Like if I woke up today, and I wasn't, I wasn't long Chipotle, but if I woke up and the stock was down $40, I would have to do some type of risk management on that. I probably, believe it or not, would not be adding to it. I would be in risk containment mode. I'd be looking to manage the, the damage. Um, Chipotle is not one that I trade on earnings. I had a very bad experience with it once. I did a, a strangle and it wound up strangling me um, for the tune of $18,000. And once you've gotten smashed like that on a stock like that, you don't really uh, hanker for more. This was a few years ago. Um, I've had some mixed results with Chipotle. I've traded it well. I've traded it badly. But um, that's, not one, that's one that is on, sort of on my do not trade list for earnings, at least before the print. It's also kind of a liquid. There's a big spread in the options. I like playing in the stocks like the Apples and the Googles because they have fairly narrow spreads and they're a little bit more um, liquid. The Chipotles and the price lines aren't as much. And I'm not really, like I said, you know, I'm not, t I'm not trying to take swipes at people who, um, who, who, you know, are, are, are doing a good job in their trading. But I'm just a little bit dubious when someone says that they have a 100% win rate or whatever. And they, you know, they don't talk about their losses, and they don't say, you know, and they think that they can catch every move. That's really not the case. Don't let people fool you about that. Don't let these guys who come on TV also fool you. They're not winning all the time either. I, I assure you. If anything, a lot of the instances they are just watching the tape and giving you their opinion of the of that moment. Anyhow, um, I think I rambled on a little bit longer than I wanted to here, but I do think that the stuff that we discussed was, was worthwhile, and I was happy to put in the time to, to do that. Um, the mar you know, one, one, the, I just want to impart the one last thing. Being in cash is also a very viable option if you're confused. I'm just trying to cover a lot of the common emails and the common DMs I get. A lot of people don't like to talk about this on the stream. If you're having a series of losing trades, just stop. Just go on the side, you know, just, just take it easy. That's, that's my, um, that's, or, or cut your size down until you become, you know, become right. Some people aren't comfortable shorting. Some people are only comfortable shorting. Know your market, know your style, know yourself, know your psychological makeup. That's really key because the truth is, is that the, the key to the market is the six inches between your ears here. And that's what gets in the way many times. Anyhow, um, the weekend review will be for this week. If you catch, if you caught this, if you come in, if you came in and you caught this one a little bit late, this video you're watching now, it will be rebroadcast on my YouTube channel. That's Justin Pulitzer Trades. You can follow me on YouTube. I'm um, sorry, on on YouTube. That it's that is the the address. But also on Twitter, it's at Justin Pulitzer. Anyhow, um, I think we had a pretty good uh, session. And cheers.